Good evening, everyone. So welcome to our first presentation of the Historical Society of St. Catharines for 2023. You can see uh, we have uh, Fort Dalhousie Conservancy, Inc. So we're we'll, uh, looking forward to that presentation and we'll have Roger Bracha introduce a speaker in just a moment. Just a couple uh, organization wide announcements I want to make. Just want to remind everyone that this is the beginning of a new year. So it's a, a new uh, a form in our newsletter, which can be filled out um, and, and mailed in and or emailed to um, sign up to become a member. We also got information on our website, which could uh, provide you with information of becoming a member. And uh, yeah, something again, we always encourage, it helps keep the organization going and allows us to put on presentations like this. Um, and second thing, I just want to give uh, people a, a very high level update on where we're heading with presentations in terms of uh, remote in person. Obviously, this rem remote presentation was a product of the pandemic. Uh, as we uh, move into some more normalcy, we will be looking to um, start having in-person presentations probably in the early spring. We're looking at April. We are looking at options where we could have in-person and uh, also do um, remote like, like we're doing now to see if it's possible to do it both ways. We are looking into technology behind it, so all I can say is that is we're looking into it, but the likelihood is we, there will be at least some form of in-person presentation starting in the spring, and by that I mean April, and um, it will, uh, we'll give you more information as we know more and test the different technology, so just something to update you on there. So that's it for my opening announcements. Uh, I'll turn it over to Roger to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Dave. Hank Bacus is currently the president of the Port Luzi Conservancy and has been for the last 12 years. And also the editor of the Port Reporter, a Port Luzi community publication, which is published four times a year. It's a great asset for the community. Hank has a BA in history and did some postgraduate work at McGill. <clears throat> Excuse me. He first got involved with the Conservancy in 2004 when the community was in the midst of resisting a 33-story tower in the middle of our heritage district. He spent 52 days in OMB hearings, presenting and cross-examining witnesses. His interest in history attracted him to the Conservancy and is an avid reader of all things Port Luzi and Niagara. Hank is married to his wife, Ruth, and have four children and have lived in the same house for almost 50 years. He is now retired, which has allowed him the time to pursue various heritage and promotional projects, of which the trolley stop is one. As a port resident, I am looking forward to Hank's presentation on the last trolley stop of the Anison T. Take it away, Hank. Okay, thank you uh, very much for your kind introduction and thank you to the society for inviting me. Um, this, it is an interesting story, I think, um, in the sense of, of uh, how, how it all came about. Um, it started with a, uh, a Facebook post in 2017. A local photographer had taken a picture of the trolley shed. There it is. There it is. And uh, posted it on Facebook along with a few comments. He received so many inquiries, and every, everyone wanted to know where it was located. Uh, since it was, uh, but since it was on private property, that he didn't want to bother the owners with people coming to look at it, so he took the post down. Fortunately, by that time, I had taken a screenshot of it. I've always had a significant interest in the NS and T streetcars that came through Port Luzi in the early 1900s, and because I was I had been doing a fair bit of reading, I recognized it immediately as the streetcar stop that had been located on Martindale Road in front of Stoke Seeds from a photograph that I had seen in my earlier research. I've never seen an ns and trolley stop before, and this building was so incredibly unique and interesting that I did some follow-up research with Nancy Cameron, our local historian, and in the following issue of the Port Reporter, our community newspaper, I wrote an article entitled The Last Trolley Stop. I, uh, I closely examined uh, the photograph and tried to figure out where it was located since the photographer wouldn't tell me. 
I knew it was in a field somewhere and figured that they wouldn't have moved it too far. One day in 2017, on my way to work, driving on Lake Shore Road in Port Luzi, I, I spotted it purely by accident. The unique outline was unmistakable. I immediately called Carlos Garcia, our ward counselor, and told him about it, and he went to see the owners, who he knew, and at that time, they didn't really want to part with it because they wanted to include it in, a, in one of their garden plans. And that was the end of it for two years. Out of the blue, in April of 2019, the owners called Mr. Garcia back and offered to donate the structure to the Port Luzi Conservancy on the condition that it be placed in a prominent place in port and not lost. I then contacted the owners and took some conservancy volunteers along to judge whether it was in sufficient condition to be restorable and whether it would be possible to move it. It was in rather poor condition. And this is likely why the owners decided restoration was simply too complex a job for them to do. Our volunteers did determine that it was indeed restorable and that it was possible to move it. We then had a second site meeting with the managing director of the Willowbank School of Restoration Arts in Queenston. And he agreed with our assessment and he expressed an interest in restoring it and using it as a student project. We felt that the Willowbank School possessed all the necessary skills and qualifications to be able to restore the shed to its original condition and that his students could use it as a hands-on opportunity to do restoration on a small building. We then brought the students who would actually be doing the work and they were very enthusiastic about it. And so our journey began. We, uh, we arranged to officially take possession. We brought in more specialized volunteers who could help us with securing the structure for transport and actually moving it to Queenston. But now really the hard work began. I'd like to just briefly give you a, a bit of a background in terms of the NS and T line in, in Port de Luzi. Um, the Port de Luzi line was the first NS and T subdivision constructed in 1900. It was officially opened on February 26, 1901. It originated at the terminal in St. Catharines at the corner of Welland and Geneva and crossed the 12 mile creek just above the GM plant and then came up at the corner of Arian Road and down Martindale making stops along the way and then over the QEW to Lakeshore and Maine and ended up finally at the pier in Lakeside Park. And I've got a few slides here which will show the story of that. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, there's a, at the, the Port de Luzi link from Port de Luzi into St. Catharines, that is the, the, uh, the first link of the NS and T. And this is where it crosses the 12 mile creek. Uh, and uh, there's, there's not oh, too many pictures of that, but there's a few. Um, and then it, it goes uh, down Martindale past the several stops along the way. And uh, then it moves, uh, and this is the, the picture, the only picture we have of the stop. Um, it's, uh, it's, if you see the right-hand side of the picture, you can just see the edge of it. Uh, but it's the only one. So that gave us the, the impetus to, to look at the Martindale Farm link. Uh, the the Port de Luzi line was used for passenger and freight service as part of the ns &T to facilitate transportation to Toronto from St. Catharines, picking up passengers and freight from the farms and canneries along the way. Later on, when it was taken over by the CNR, who built Lakeside Park in 1925, it became very a very popular passenger route both for leisure and freight. Passengers from Toronto and St. Catharines could mingle at the park. After it left the, the Martindale farm, you can see it go uh, over the trestle into Port Luzi and down Main Street towards the park. And then finally it goes down into the park. These are early shots. Uh, the next one is also even earlier because it's an open-sided car, but you can see like you have a better view of Lakeside Park. 
the, the the various stops it ended up in the park here and then ultimately it ended up especially for freight it ended up on the pier right here the various stops were originally numbered uh but later named and it was a very busy line and trains ran every 30 minutes or more often especially during picnics and special events and at the dance hall it was not unusual to have up to 75 cars a day in passenger traffic alone this particular stop the one we're talking about was called the barnsdale stop this is one of the uh, i forget where i got this um, but it shows all the stops if you can see the at the top left hand side the first stop from St. Catharines was St. Paul and James and on the city loop and then Lake and Louisa, Woodruffs, Houtbees, Barnsdale, right in the middle, Lakeshore Road and Canning Factory at the end of Corbett and finally Lakeside Park. Uh, so this particular stop that we're talking about is the Barnsdale stop. It was 3.15 miles from the downtown terminal, and it was situated at 370 Martindale Road in front of the Martindale farm. To look at the history a little bit, uh, we have to look at this particular slide. Um, the first thing we did, uh, we did some background research with Nancy Cameron. Uh, our local historian, which we found very interesting indeed. We confirmed that this was indeed the Barnsdale stop of the ns and and had been previously located at the 370 Martindale. It had been located directly across the tracks from the Martindale farm, after which the road was named. We have a photograph of it in front of the gate. You can see the farm buildings in the background. There was a double track there so trains could pass each other. So it was an ideal location. Its relationship to the farm be, became very evident. The property is very interesting in itself and has a lot of depth of history in St. Catharines. The property was owned by John Martindale from about the 1820s. It was passed on to his son, Wales Martindale, who sold it in 1865 to Edward McArdle. In 1908, the property was inherited by McArdle's nephews, James and Hugh McSloy. Now, the, the McSloys were a very wealthy and prominent St. Catharines family. In 1884, they had established the Canada Haircloth Factory in St. Catharines, which is now part of Brock University behind the PAC. The McSloys were also responsible for donating the land downtown for the original Carnegie Public Library at the corner of Church and James. Their personal mansion stood at the corner of Carlisle and Church. Both are now demolished, of course. The, the McSloy brothers made the Martindale farm into a district beauty spot and showplace. New buildings were built, including the barn, greenhouses, and their home. An attractive stone gateway with two columns featuring a wrought iron display identifying as the Martindale farm it was also built at that time. It's highly likely that this uh, trolley shed or streetcar shelter, I tend to use these terms interchangeably, uh, was built at about the same time as well, since it very much matches the construction of their outbuildings. Given the effort and care they put into their buildings and their prominence as a family, it would be highly unusual for them not to have had a hand in it since it was right in front of their home. Its unique design and it's larger, it is larger and more elaborate than any other NS and T stops that we've seen. Most were decidedly plain affairs if there was a stop shelter at all. The McSloy farm was widely known for fruits and vegetables. It was also nationally recognized as a model Guernsey dairy farm and raised a number of thoroughbred show horses. The McSloys held many shows and displays of produce and livestock and the public was encouraged to tour their beautiful property and facilities. And for this reason, the trolley shed would have been of use to a great many visitors. In 1945, just five years before the Portaluzzi line officially closed, the McSloy family sold the property to James Stork, a local fruit grower who later sold 150 acres to Stoke Seeds, which operated there until 1993. In 1950, uh, when the Portaluzzi line closed, the trolley shed became redundant and the tracks were 
were removed and the shed was of course surplus. It was likely moved by wagon or potentially skidded on a sled on an icy winter road sometime between the demise of the streetcar line and the amalgamation of Port Luzi with St. Catharines in 1960. We did confirm that it sat on that, on that uh, property for 55 years in, by uh, 2017. The current owners have lived on that farm for 60 years. The building was preserved uh, partly because the owners made sure that it was re-roofed and that the windows were either in good repair or filled with plywood. The unique shape of it with large overhangs also protected the building from the weather. We note that the paint, which was several layers deep, was similar to the CNR colors of government green that used to cover many of the buildings in Lakeside Park. So uh, once we got a hold of it and it became it came into our possession, we had to do something with it. So the big move. So this is what it looked like uh, at the beginning. Uh, and moving a building like that is in, in, in rather delicate condition was a lot of work. The, the logistics and the effort involved was considerable. We first had to remove the roof because the float that we had access to made the structure too high to travel on the highway due to MTO rules. The structure itself was delicate and the floor particularly was rotting away and had to be removed. Secondly, it was extremely heavy and, the, and uh, we estimate somewhere between two and three tons and moving it required some in ingenuity. We were very fortunate that the owners of it were very cooperative because they took a great deal of pride in it and were also very cooperative in helping us. So the first day we spent uh, cleaning out the shed and removing pieces that were not part of the shed and planned our moving strategy. The second day was spent removing all the delicate parts, including some of the siding, the leaded glass windows and the door, as well as all the shingles to try to reduce weight and make it easier to handle. The third day was moving day and we rented jacks to uh, lift the entire building up by the roof so that we could cut out the rot underneath and create a smooth platform to move it on. Once the platform was in place, uh, we, we disconnected the roof from the building, rolled it on rollers out from under it, and winched the building onto a flatbed and shipped it off to Willow Bank. Here you can see a picture of the us having rolled it out on pipes uh, and it was, uh, we reinforced it so that it would, it would stay in good condition. And uh, here you can see the roof is off of it. And uh, there it's on the float. And that's me to the right there. Um, so uh, on the second load, we had to get a wide load permit for the roof because of its width. We also rolled it onto the trailer as well, but with considerably with considerable difficulty and transported it to Willow Bank as well. Even the roof was very heavy, even though, and it was very awkward. Anyway, at the end of the day, our four wheel, our four way flashers flashing, we got everything on regional roads to Queenston for restoration without further incident. So here you can see it, the roof is on the trailer. We had taken all the shingles off to try to reduce the weight because there was a few layers on there. And then uh, there it is, uh, there's the, the base of it on the, on the trailer. And there we're going down the road. And there it is safely arrived in, uh, in Queenston. And this was the lower campus of the school. So we estimate that about 85% uh, of, the, of the original structure has been salvaged. So what started out as an estimated four month project has dragged out for four years. COVID meant that the Willowbank School was closed and the class that was to work on it was only able to, part, to partially repair the structure. Subsequent classes and changes in Willowbank personnel meant that the restoration process was dragged out over a considerable amount of time over which we had little control. So what restoration was done? 
Uh, the entire subfloor was replaced and the original remaining flooring was reinstalled. In other words, the, the frame underneath it was taken out, but the boards and the planking uh, of the that we could salvage, they were all numbered when we took it apart and uh, were salvaged and they were reinstalled on the new frame. Um, so the entire roof was repaired and shingled with cedar shake shingles, which would have matched the original. Here you can see it getting getting closer and here's the final roof. The completed roof then had to be lifted back onto the structure by a crane, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, any exterior shingles or, or, or siding that needed repair was replaced or renewed as found necessary. Uh, that, that's it after it was painted. Uh, the door, we took the door out, was taken to a shop in Port Luzi. There's a side view of it. And uh, we took the door to a shop in Port Luzi and cut it in half in order to make it useful for future use as a Dutch serving door. The leaded glass windows were repaired and we purchased magnetite covers to make them secure because if it's going to be in a public place, uh, we're concerned about damage. Two windows, there was four windows in it, and two of them were changed to opening ones, so to allow some, some airflow and also to provide some further usefulness to us. Uh, everything was painted with period linseed oil-based paints, and uh, yeah, it, that's, that's where it is right now. The, the exterior patina is intact. The interior, the interior uh, is original and includes the graffiti and the carvings that one would expect from bored passengers waiting for a streetcar. One carving in particular is, is of interest, uh, which I'll show you here. Um, and that is, it has a, because it has a date on it, uh, it's April 21, uh, 1918. It indicated IWW, who were, was the International Workers of the World, which is a, a labor movement at the time that was opposed to the First World War and was actually banned at the time. In fact, in September 24, 2018, a few months after this was carved, the IWW was, was, was declared illegal and the membership was punished by internment in one of 24 internment camps in Canada. There is a paper uh, for anyone interested prepared by the students entitled uh, Restoration Rationale and Methodology, which is available for those interested in additional detail. There's the students in, uh, inside, which they, uh, as they were starting to work on it. So the, the question uh, is, where are we at today? Um, it's finally finished. Uh, this is on the lower campus. Um, and uh, in June of 2022, uh, Willowbank indicated to us that we had to move it since they were selling their lower campus and their closing date was coming up. Now, because of the increased height of the trolley shed, now that the roof was back on, the Conservancy had a special frame built, which is only 10 inches from the ground and fitted pre precisely under it so that it could be transported with the roof on. So uh, to try to avoid any legalities, early on a quiet Sunday morning, it was moved back to the farm where we found it, and that is currently where it sits ready for its installation. There it is, you can see it sitting on the, on, on, on the frame. And uh, it was just under the height limit, so. Um, the city of St. Catharines has gr now granted us a heritage permit for placement, but there are still some unrelated issues to work out. The city has been very reluctant to take on an additional small structure like this due to maintain maintenance and liability concerns. We do expect that we'll be able to work through these issues this winter and hope to place it at the head of the lock one stage where it will be useful to serve community concerts and be used as a port welcoming center for those who visit port. There it's on the trailer back where it started. And this is where we hope to put it. Once it is in place, 
there will need to be a few upgrades and finishing touches to it, like the, elect the installation of electric power and perhaps some shelving, perhaps a more durable floor so that it will have the maximum usefulness to the community. But we hope that it will become an iconic historic centerpiece for a revived Fort Dalhousie. So that is it. Thank you. And I'm available for questions. There's a few of our volunteers. That's it. What I'll do now, I'll see if anyone has any questions. Um, what you could do is uh, raise your virtual hand and that's an easy way for me to see. I can see one already. So I will ask, uh, or Gail, why don't you go ahead? Well, hi, uh, Hank, th thank you so much. That was uh, great. I know I've been very supportive of this um, movement on the on the uh, the building itself. And I, gosh, I hope uh, you can get it through city council and through the um, uh, powers that be, if you will, that uh, that it be placed there because it's it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous little artifact, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's pretty unique. Uh, I'm, I'm I was surprised that that was as, as uh, interesting and unique as it was. It's worth saving, I think. Absolutely. And uh, ha have you are you still raising money for it? May I ask? Um, we have been raising money for it. The, the the roadblock that we have is that a lot of people who are, are willing to donate money if they know where it's going to be. And and uh, since we haven't been able to, to do that, we have pledges uh, available uh, that we have to go back to once we have confirmation that we can place it. Right. I have another part of a question, if I may, still. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, have any of the members of the uh, I think it's the railways. I don't know what it's called. Perhaps Dennis can help me out with that. Uh, uh, conservation, uh, NSNT, yeah, Andy Panko, uh, uh, Chapman. Have they have they shown any yes. interest in, in it at all? Yes, they have. They they've been supportive, and they have pledged some funds towards it as well, as well as funds for a plaque, uh, with which tells the story of it. Right. So yes, they have been they've been kept up to date all along. And would the plaque be through them? Or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Rather than the city. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's a gorgeous little place. Yeah. Uh, just a comment here. Someone says impressive effort. Delighted to see. Sorry, I just clicked off. See the photos. Great art of the archival photos. Uh, any other questions? I'm just looking to see again if the easiest way for me to see questions is if people raise their virtual hand. I think, oh, someone, uh, John, Al or John Allen. Yes, David. Uh, I did a very similar project on a trolley shelter for the HGB line that ran from Hamilton, Grimsby, and Beansville. And I have a few pictures. Can I share a screen and show as a compare? Very similar building. There, in the middle of that, is the second use of my shed as a fruit stand in the Radio Village, which is halfway between Grimsby and Beansville. There's a little description of the Radio Village. They put a bunch of the railway cars together to make a diner and motel accommodations. Okay, there, there's the beginning, the announcement of a project to build it in 1891, I believe it was. There's a newspaper article about it with the old shed in the background, and that was 18 in 19. 89, I believe it was. There's where it used to sit at the corner of Durham Road in front of that winery, which is now a traffic circle. There's, I just stuck it there to show where it, where it was. There's a little talk about the Radio Village, how they put the cars together in a diner. There is the diner. And in the middle of the picture, you see the little triangular building with an extra roof put on it because it's already been dragged up there to be used as a fruit stand in the shelter to protect the roof or the fruit. There is a advertising for the uh, business there. In the far right corner, you can see the fruit stand again. And that's the Radio Village. There's a black and white version of that same postcard. If you want to stop for a bite to eat, 
There's the diner inside one of the railway cars. There's another advertisement for it. There's the railway cars made into a diner. There is my shed when I found it. Wow. It, it had been the trolley stop. Then it had been the fruit stand. And then in the 60s or 50s, it was towed up to this farm. And it had a fridge, a stove, and a bed in it. And it was used as a room for uh, farm workers. You can still see the extra roof there that was protecting the fruit when they had it as a fruit stand. We removed that. There it is, we skidded it down the road. And you talked about getting a permit. I thought about that too. I called the Niagara region, asked them what I had to do. And they said, well, first you have to get a $3 million liability uh, clause. I said, okay, thank you very much, goodbye. <laughs> and we just skidded it through the neighboring field, down the road past the local police station, up a side road. And there's where it was gonna go uh, in the little ghost image up there. Cause as we dug our pool, we used it for a pool house. And there it is completed. That's the HG and B trolley bus line. When we got it up in the rafters, like Hank said, there was autographs carved into it. And one of them was a fellow's name in 1894. We put screen in it and used it as a little privacy spot. Plus the pumps were in there. There's some different angles of it. Made a very good change house and pool house, different angles. And then we decided to dig a hole beside it and put a pond in. There's some action shots of the trolleys line going down through Main Street and Greenwich because in the later years they use they shipped a lot of fruit with it, and uh, it it wasn't much of a passenger line anymore. There's one of the cars coming up the hill in Grimsby. Another car right in the heart of town. There's the house that it sits behind now on Main Street in Grimsby. We sold that back in 2003, but we had a lot of fun there. But in behind is the pool with the pool house. There's another version of the house. And let me see here, some other notes I was gonna say about it. When we stripped it down, the one cavity in the walls was full of bees. We had fun with the beehive. And look how similar it is to your building. And uh, what else did we do? We, we were very fortunate in moving it. I don't know whether it was built on them or installed later for the move to the uh, fruit stand, but it was on two telephone poles. We just towed it down the road. And it, uh, it was very easy to move. And what else? I think that was it. So as you can see, it looks very, oh, there's a little, little bit of a note from a different uh, details about it, but very similar to yours, except for that gable over the door. Yeah. There it is. Like you say, that, that's it for them. So you can see it was very similar. And when I saw the notice of your meeting, I, I had to join in and see it for sure. Thank you for letting me share this. Now, how do we get out of it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, extra pages. Oh, pause the share. That'll do it. Hey, stop the share. Right. We're back in business. Oh, thank you, Hank. That was very interesting. And uh, you can see why I was interested in it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a uh, couple of questions here I'll get to. Let me just see the ones. Um, let me just see. Okay. Someone says here, uh, a very impressive project. Someone says, my dad told me stories of taking the ns and t from well into the park. They would take the ferry over to Toronto to visit relatives. They did not have a car. Question, is there someone that we could be writing in the writing to in the government or sort of writing in the city government to help push this along? Uh, also, as a side note, I love your lectures. Even if you go back to in-person meeting, Zoom is great for people like myself. Okay, I was born and raised in Niagara area, but I live now in VT, I'm guessing it's Vermont. So thank you. But uh, anyways, I guess the question is about, uh, yeah, I guess we can ask is, Maybe just uh, you did mention this before, but where are things with respect to like the, um, in the historical designation? Like where where exactly is it in the process right now? Well, it doesn't it doesn't have a historical designation. What it has is that we have a heritage permit which we need to do in order to place it. Any building, uh, the Port Dalhousie Heritage District is one of the largest in Ontario. 
and anything you do in the heritage district requires a heritage permit. So we have that permit in hand, um, but the the issues that are outstanding are largely political. And I guess maybe that that's the question this person's asking and says, is there someone in the city who they could write to to help push this along? Um, certainly a uh, mayor and council. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say the councillors, yeah, and mayor, as you said. That way you fixed. catch everybody. Yeah. Just seeing if there's, are there any other questions here? Oh, uh, John? Yeah, I uh, enjoy doing pictures and I've been doing a slide presentation on Grimsby Beach, then now the old Chautauqua community that was in Grimsby. And I must have presented this slide show about 40 times. I'd love to do it. On, I did it on a Zoom show for the St. Catharines Library. But if you guys ever need a speaker, give me a shout. And who would, who would I would best to contact for information on that? Like the, the email for Historical Society. We can have further discussions offline. Which, on which one, St. Catharines or... Uh, uh, I, I um, it's, it would be online. I just don't know what offhand. Okay. Uh, or, I'm, I'm, I've got my hand up. I'm just suggesting that he says, you know, goes right onto our site, yeah. our website, and sends it through to uh, to our secretary through the historical society, and those of us who do programming will certainly look at it. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you. And I, uh, can I just say that I notice. And some other chats that have come in, one about Jordan and one about did the NSNT have a role on Emancipation Day? Are, yeah, that was a question. Did you see came, that yeah. one? And there was an earlier one about my husband lives in Jordan. I can't see that now. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I noticed that too. I don't see that anymore. I do see the one where it's, this is, uh, Hank, maybe you can assist with this more of a general question. It says, did the NSNT have a role on Emancipation Day? Um. I really don't know uh, what that connection would be other than the fact that it, that they would be transporting people into the park. Uh, Emancipation Days uh, had anywhere from eight to 10,000 people in that small area. And uh, there was, you know, there was a lot of, it took a lot of transport to get them there. And I think the, uh, a lot of people came over from Toronto by, by boat, but there was also a lot of people that came from different parts uh, even from the U.S. Uh, to Emancipation Days and and the cars, I'm sure, especially when it was a high volume day, they would put on extra cars and uh, and transport everybody in and out again. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? If I'm missing anyone, I don't. Again, easiest way for me to see is putting your virtual hand up. I don't see any. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, John? Yeah. Yes, uh, about the Emancipation Day, that was a big deal at uh, Greenwich Beach as well. If you can imagine that small area of Greenwich Beach, they had 16,000 people in one day. So many sold that they had to let them off, not just at the Greenwich Beach train stop, but they let them off at Beansville and Greenwich and brought them in by horse and buggy. Mm -hmm. Emancipation was a big, a big deal for the, because it went from a Methodist campground into an amusement park in about 1910, and it, it was very popular. It had a greater attendance than the c and &E, believe it or not, except the c and &E was uh, a short period, whereas Grinchy Beach was two full summer months. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, if there are no questions then, I think we can uh, conclude the presentation. Uh, Hank, I just wanna thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, very interesting. I know at least from my perspective, I'm gonna be following uh, its development uh, <laughs> in the months or hopefully not years to come, but hopefully we can hear a lot more of it. And like you said, it's a political issue. So hopefully we can get uh, people to come around uh, to assist you on that as needed. So uh, once again, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, thanks to all of our members for coming out again. And otherwise we'll see everyone in the fourth week in February. Thanks. Okay. Thank you everyone. Thanks Hank. Just uh, a note for, uh, for John Allen, I, I've dropped the, um, Historical Society email address in the chat. Yes, I see that. Okay. Thank you. All right, no problem. And thank you for uh, 
making this sort of a dual presentation for us tonight. Little bonus. Yeah. 